them. Oh, there we go. Got the creepy recording in progress. Um, <laughs> so feel free to unmute or, you know, if you don't want to just jump in, toss something in the chat as we go along. That would be much, much, uh, much appreciated. So <clears throat> um, I, I like that uh, in the intro, um, uh, Jay, you talked about, you know, how I like to work and how I see the change, because that's really what these ideas are all about. It's, you know, we're kind of in that world where everything needs to be a thing. So everything has to have a label or a fancy diagram for people to get it. And I remember somebody um, asking or not asking, but making fun of me on uh, Twitter saying, oh, all you did was staple the word lean in front of change management. And I'm like, well, I, I couldn't just put a picture of my face and say, Jason likes to work this way. Who the hell's going to buy a book called that? Doesn't make any sense. But really, that's what it is. This is the last uh, six to seven years of traveling the world and finding patterns about where people were getting stuck with change and what was getting them unstuck. So um, a, a brief, brief history in time, like I said, it was that enterprise telecom that I was working for where uh, it just seemed like we were pushing water uphill with a stick. And uh, it was New Year's Eve day. I was sitting there on their campus, this gigantic uh, building, um, the size of a city block here in Canada, uh, just outside of Toronto, thinking, you know, this, this last year has been a waste. Nothing's working. Um, and I wanted to try to figure out why. So that started off a series of ideas that uh, first created a, an Agile Transformation live lesson series, which is actually hilarious to watch now because it's almost 10 years old. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers Pearson Live Lessons or Front Row Agile as it was evolved into at some point. So uh, uh, Lisa Adkins and I went down to their studios in Washington and recorded the first two live lesson video series uh, to, to launch that brand like back in 20, 2011 or so. And then that led yeah, to a I, bunch of... I, I, I have a life, lesson, uh, a life lessons from Pearson as well. Okay, cool. Awesome. Managing the unmanageable turn to our, 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 whoops, this way, our oh. book <laughs> is, 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 uh, is a live lessons video. So uh, cool to, cool to meet someone else. Yeah, oh, cool, cool. I, I don't think Front Row Agile is a thing anymore because I, I know they bought a bunch of licenses to those live lesson thingies or for Pearson Education and now they, they're closed down and it's something else now. But I think the live lessons and Safari books are still around that have that stuff on it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they're, I think they're. I think they're branding all their videos with live lessons these days. Okay. So you know, back then, it's there, there's 20 bazillion how to do an agile transformation things nowadays. Back then, there really wasn't anything. Um, there were, you know, James Shore, Diana Larson, uh, Johanna Rothman, Esther Derby, Steve Smith, Don Gray, Jerry Weinberg. Those folks have been talking about the organizational change aspect of agile forever. I mean, Jerry Weinberg wrote about this stuff in the 60s before Agile was even a thing. Um, so it's definitely not new. It's just once we got into this whole enterprise Agile thing, you know, would it be safe to say 2011, 12 is when the enterprise bug started, uh, people started getting bit by the enterprise bug? Because if you go back to the history of all the Agile Alliance conferences, it was a lot of technical talks, a lot of team process talks, and then it seems like 2011-12 is when the things started shifting more towards enterprise-related topics. Um, so that led to a bunch of things. The first version of the book came out in 2012 on LeanPub, and, uh, and then 2014 when I released it, I uh, went on what I call the least rock and roll world tour ever, the change management world tour. And went around to about 12, 13 different countries, worked in or visited or trained in a bunch of different organizations, thousands of change people, all with the goal of trying to figure out why people were getting stuck and what was getting them unstuck. Um, and it turned out that there was a pattern. So the five universals that I'm going to talk about is, you know, think of, uh, has anybody ever had a new boss? Or has anybody had a new neighbor that moved in? So did you go onto Google and say, what's the eight-step framework for successfully integrating neighbor relationship to gain maximum ROI that will ensure success? 
Sure, sure. Wish, sure wish I'd done that with uh, the next boss. <laughs> Larry, that's exactly what I said. Yep, perfect. So for, what I discovered was somehow people lose their freaking minds when it comes to trying to help their organizations change. They forget, we forget everything about being a human. We forget everything about relationships and we focus on making sure we have the best method that will get other people to change. How can I get those people to buy in? How can I get, uh, how can I overcome resistance from that group of people? Uh, how can I get those people to change their mindsets? And we forget that our organizations are social systems. They, they, they have always and will always want to run on relationships. And this quote from John, does anybody know who John Seeley Brown is? What, what his, I guess, claim to fame would be of many? <clears throat> I have his book here, but it's under a big stack. So if I pull it out, everything's going to fall. So he, he's the author of uh, Social Information of Life, but he was also one of the head honchos at uh, Park Research for Xerox in the 70s. And they arguably created the, uh, the laptop, the computer mouse, uh, the graphical user interface. And does anybody know how much money Xerox made from the things they invented? They pretty yeah. much failed to market them. Mm -hmm. Zero. Yep. Zero. And they had a great research facility, the brightest people, the right process. And in his own words, he says he didn't have relationships with his peers that made all the money for the company. So they were just perceived as a bunch of uh, prima donna uh, weirdos over in that building doing stuff that didn't matter. And nobody wanted to listen to them. So it wasn't about the process and the technology and all the things that they did. It was, they didn't work on the relationships. They didn't open up what they were doing to the rest of the organization. They didn't ask how they could help solve problems. Um, and I think we really underestimate the, the impact of the, how the relationships in our organization shape the change. So when I went around, um, the interesting thing was, you know, you get, again, go to LinkedIn. And you'll find everybody's pushing, you, you need this method, you need this model, you need this new thing. Uh, um, this is what you need to be able to get change to work. It's always externalized. It's always me as the change agent. I'm awesome. Everything I do is great. I've got the best method. It's those people I can't get to do it. So I need something else to help me do it. But what I found was what people actually wanted. I actually had a stack of thousands of these uh, stickies that I went through a, a good exercise on trying to find what those patterns were. They need something to jiggle the change loose when it's stuck. It's not about looking at a new framework or a method or a model. It's things like change isn't going well. I've got to update our 14 stakeholders tomorrow. Everybody's stressed out. What can I do that has impact? So you probably see, you know, change experts talking about how change is a journey. It, it's not, it's not event-based, but it is event-based. It's all of our interactions in the system. Every time we intervene, that's what jiggles things loose. I mean, if you want to get technical, you could say that's the, that's the, the act sense and respond from comple the complex domain or even the disorder domain of Canavan. I typically don't talk about any of those models because nobody cares about them, but us, right? People in companies don't care that they're in the complex domain, right? They just want to know, why is my boss being a dick? I just want to do this change. They don't care about that technical stuff. So they really want something that is going to help them with an intervention at a particular point in time that's going to take a step forward. And these were uh, the four main things that folks were interested in. So those percentages are based on the percentage of the, the, the times that those four categories were mentioned on a sticky note over the last six, six years or so. So people, they wanted more modern ideas for change because people don't realize that the more popular methods predate, that we have today predate the internet. They were designed in a completely different era. Some still have some relevancy today, but folks were after the way we used to do change doesn't work. What's a more modern approach? 
I need more modern tools and practices. Um, the, the second most important for them was, what am I not seeing that I could see differently? Um, and it could be, this is from actual change agents who have I've interacted with that said those things never worked. They just, we didn't really talk about it. Um, but they, they predate the world we live in today. Uh, the third thing, getting alignment and co-creating. People wanted to know, how do I get people on board? How do I create alignment? How do I do co-creation? How do I involve the people who are affected by the change in the design of it? And the last was understanding organizational physics. So what are the friction points? Like, where are we getting stuck? Uh, what is our change competing with? And how can we make that visible so we can understand why change isn't happening? Or there's so much inertia and timing. You know, I worked, um, I've worked in lots of seasonal organizations. So uh, one of the telecoms, generally speaking, back to school and Christmas are number one and two seasons for telecoms. So June to August is a horrible time to do change. And so is end of October up until mid-January. That's a really bad time to introduce any changes because they're focused on run the business and their two biggest revenue generating seasons. So organizational physics is, was, was all of that type of stuff. All of the dynamics, existing changes, friction points um, that are in the way for, uh, for us uh, to get these changes to work. So it, it was interesting um, to talk about the, just this, this idea of uh, trying to break down our approaches for change into repeatable structured methods, right? If we just have the right standard or the right set of steps, we can ensure successful change. But the variable are humans and we vary on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's impossible to go into two organizations, two different organizations with the same approach and get the same result. It just will never work that way. Um, there's too many factors to say that if, if we just applied the steps properly, it would always work because every context is different. But that sounds icky, right? If, if we go into every situation thinking, well, we need a customized approach for change for, for every scenario, um, that's very taxing on the thinking part of our brain. So we want to distill things down and use reductionism to make sure we have the right steps and standards and tools and things like that. So the, the idea with, with the five universals was how can we shift away from that old traditional way of thinking about change and uh, more towards some of these patterns. So I'm just gonna talk about the, the three components of uh, the, the, the next, I guess, generation of ideas that's based on, you know, those last six, six years of traveling. <clears throat> and then I'll get into some stories and examples and feel free to like toss some questions in the chat or, or unmute and ask a question at any time. So when I released the book, I released another mini book called The Art and Science of Change that I really didn't do anything with because um, it was just an idea. It wasn't baked at all. And it was really what I found was uh, over the years, there were, there were change agents that had these intangible qualities of knowing how to balance the art and science of change. And uh, I like to call them golden retrievers. And I always usually uh, 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 precursor that with, this is not meant as an insult. I'm not comparing humans to dogs, blah, blah, blah. Everybody loves golden retrievers. Even if you're not a dog person, you love golden retrievers. Does anybody not like golden retrievers? Anybody, anybody? I guess unless you're allergic, maybe that would be bad. But there's just something endearing about the personality of them, right? They're, they're warm, they're welcoming, they're fun, and people just love being around them. And I found that there were always, in all of these companies that were, were moving change forward, they had somebody like that, at least one person. They weren't just a catalyst, because we're taught that you need catalyst leadership, so they had, that was one element of their personality. They had solid relationships through all the different pockets of the organization. They were connected to HR, development, the C-suite, 
they just, they had built relationships because they've worked all over the organization, which means they have good relationships, a big network, um, and good experience about how the organization ticks. So they had all these intangible qualities and they just knew how to balance these things at the right time. Um, and it was, and it's hard to replicate. And the second thing was the, uh, the engine that they were using to run their changes. And uh, pe people have always asked, you know, I think even in the book, I said, it's, I, I don't know if it's a framework or a method, you can call it what you want, but Again, I can't call it how Jason likes to work because again, nobody would buy that book. But really the, the insights, options, experiments, it's exactly the same as plan, do, check, act, which is exactly the same as build, measure, learn from lean startup. It's to use uh, insights and feedback to drive your actions versus planning everything in isolation. Um, friend of mine, somebody, uh, I don't know if you know Heather Stagel, who's based out of Atlanta, she um, has a great book called 99 Ways to Influence Change. And it's an awesome, awesome, really easy read. And she likes to say, if you're doing change management uh, in the office with the door closed, you're doing it wrong. So the idea of this feedback driven system is to listen to the system and shape your change based on what the system needs instead of what it is you want the change to be. And then the third part is all of the elements that help us get unstuck. So I, I get people who say, well, where do I, you know, how do I start with the lean change management framework? What's the first step? And I said, well, typically we would do, um, we would do a strategic change canvas. Why this change? Why now? Who's affected and how? And what are we going to do about it? How are we going to know if we're making progress? How are we going to know when we've got there? I said, well, we, we started this three months ago. We already have the business case. We already have the budget. We're already going to do the change no matter what. So your, your framework doesn't work, which is kind of crazy. It's kind of like saying baseball doesn't work. I tried baseball and baseball doesn't work. Um, so the idea with the elements is you pick an element that helps you start with where you're at. Uh, one of the government organizations I did some work with here, uh, the first thing we did was visualize the existing program. So they already, I think they had three vendors. It was a three-year modernization program. And so obviously they, they already had their budget for three years. They had the vendors picked. They had all that stuff in place. So the first thing we did is we visualized uh, the program on a wall. We canceled all of the program synchronization type of meetings. And we had the stakeholders meet in front of that wall for 15 minutes once a week. And that was the first experiment. So when people say, well, where do you start with this framework? Well, it really depends on where you're at. So those elements are designed to give you something that can um, help you disturb the system so you can see how it reacts. It helps you get to action sooner based on your context. The one I'm going to go into is, is one of these elements, um, the five universals. And I call them universals on purpose because we see that these frameworks and methods have values and principles, but in my opinion, those are human things. And I think whenever we see them attached to a framework or a model, it, it's, it could be a few reasons. One is it just reflects the creator's personality and their own beliefs, or two, it's intentionally created for marketing. But those inanimate things don't have principles. Humans do. So suppose you you, you don't agree with the principles of Scrum. Uh, are you allowed to use it? Like it's, it's silly. So calling them universals is things like when I mentioned, have you ever had a new neighbor or a new boss? It's things we can all understand. We can all understand that if somebody moves in next door, uh, you know, maybe before COVID, you'd knock on the door and say, hey, I'm Biff, here's some muffins or whatever. Um, once you get settled, we'd like to have you over for dinner. That's a universal thing we all know and understand. And it turns out with change, there's similar. There's, there's these five universals that help us move things forward that brings the humanity back. So um, again, urgency being step one uh, in Cotter's model. So we have to create urgency. There's a few challenges with that. One being when we talk about urgency, usually it's from the perspective of 
the person asking for the change or the organization. So it's urgent that we raise revenue from X to Y or we increase shareholder value from X to Y. It's one of many perspectives. And he warns about false urgency, but I don't think people read far enough uh, in, in Cotter's work to actually realize what he means by urgency because uh, he does warn about false urgency. And we kind of live in a false urgent world, wouldn't you say? If you go on social media right now, you could spend five minutes on it and you would think the world's coming to an end in the next 10 minutes. Everything is over sensationalized and urgent. So a change at work is just one more thing that's on the top of our thinking pile to think about. So it creates more stress, it creates more anxiety. And um, I'm not sure people realize where the term burning platform came from. Does anybody know where it came from? The term burning platform? Where did it originate from? Does anybody know? I don't know the phrase at all. So it's uh, in the change world, it's oil? We, need, we need to create a burning pot platform. Yeah, was that was uh, it the oil in industry? Yeah, yeah, it's literally a platform that's burning and uh, oil derricks out in the ocean. Yeah, 167 people died. So it was we uh, burning platform. So you can take your chances and jump, or certainly die in the platform. And I think that's the worst possible metaphor for change. Uh, but the, it's still widely in use. We need to create urgency and a burning platform for people. And it just puts us, I think, in a bad spot for starting change. So if we flip the conversation towards how do we create more of a sense of purpose or something we can rally around and create alignment from, uh, this picture is from an organization that they expected to double in size over a year. And they wanted to keep the good things about being small and nimble, as they called it, but they didn't want everything to get completely out of control. So they, they were looking at Agile, said, well, we have, we have to hire an Agile coach so we can be more Agile, um, and then we'll get things under control. And I did this uh, session with them, and the model that is on the screen there was the structure is um, a metaphor for their, their platform in their company and like the structure of their company. And all the pieces underneath were things that they had changed over the, over the years. And they realized that they were much more resilient than they gave themselves credit for. And they knew that they, they, could, they knew how to reinvent their, themselves when they needed to. So it turned out they didn't actually really need to change anything. They just needed to explore this feeling of uncertainty. And we did that session and we actually didn't end up doing a transformation, as you would call it. We just did a few tune-ups with some of the teams. Um, and it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't, uh, hey, we're going to transform the organization. They found that they did have a strong purpose. They were in the healthcare market and, and they kind of believed that their purpose was to take care of people. So it wasn't just profit. If you're familiar with uh, Joseph Bragdon's work, uh, profit over uh, profit for life, companies that follow purpose over profit outperform their peers five to one, three to one or five to one financially, because they follow a higher purpose as opposed to just pursuing profit. Um, I'll put that in the chat. If you Google profit for life. So how can we flip that conversation? How can we try to understand that what is urgent for the organization isn't urgent for everybody, right? So if our goal is um, we want to be faster, better, cheaper, so we can make more money, how is that compelling for a tester on a team? So we create that urgency. We don't see that tester doing something different. We blame them as, as being a resistor and we try to overcome it. So if we can flip the conversation away from that false urgency and more towards a cause and purpose, uh, one company that um, I did a bunch of work with, they're in this example, they talked about how their transformation was a generational change. This is a large financial organization. Um, for them, it wasn't a 12 month program. It wasn't, you know, uh, what we see with a lot of transformations today. Sorry, I'm just fixing the alignment of that piece of text. Their leaders would be open about saying, we're going to be retired before we, this transformation is quote unquote done. 
So the second thing is how do we get away from broadcasting style communications and move towards dialogue? Dialogue is how, how we help a system see itself. It's the interaction in that dialogue is what helps us explore those problems, not when we tell people why the change is good for them. So th th this organization, uh, we would do these annual summits with a couple hundred people and CTO, CEO were always uh, on stage for these things, talking about whatever our theme was for the year. And we had big screens behind them. And uh, we we're using a tool called Slido. People were asking questions in real time anonymously, giving us feedback on how the sessions are going. And it was all public information. So it wasn't how many, how many times has anybody been in a town hall that's scripted? So we want leaders to be seen answering these questions. So they're carefully crafted and we give people the questions that they're supposed to ask in advance, um, which is you know a standard communication style practice. We did the opposite. We just said, screw it. Let's just make it anonymous. Let people ask whatever they want in the context of this transformation. Because if we don't create that meaningful dialogue, th this, this whole thing is pointless. And I remember the question the CTO got asked was, um, you keep telling us how we need to change. What are you prepared to change? So of course that gets voted right up to the top and he answered it very well. He said, well, you know, I'm highly competitive. I push too much. And uh, a thing I need to work on is laying back and being patient to, to let the changes happen versus continually pushing. So they had a whole different attitude towards their transformation. It wasn't just, we're gonna go from A to B. Um, they actually acknowledged they're going to make things a lot worse in the short term for their customers while they completely strip away why they exist as a company. Uh, they were following uh, Theory U from Otto Sharma as, as kind of their mantra. I don't know if anybody's heard of Theory U. Um, so they're talking deep transformation. And uh, yeah, the, these things were great. Uh, these questions that we did, because th this freaks out the communications person. They're like, oh my God, 6% of the people think it's getting worse. We better do something. Or can you hide that? <laughs> can you hide that answer? We're like, nope, let's talk about it. That's the whole point. Uh, we have to be able to talk about these things and we have to have positive friction. That's, that's what's going to move things forward. That's how humanity moves forward. Um, and then the funny thing is if we don't have that, my argument is, do we really need to be doing this change in the first place? Is it really necessary or is it just busy work because we have budget to spend? Um, and that usually creates a really interesting conversation. So if we can get away from broadcasting at people and move more towards creating that dialogue, uh, this organization, the CEO would do uh, roundtables with 20, 30 people. They would do lean coffees uh, with the CEO um, his goal was to be able to have a session with every person in the company throughout this process of going down the U and theory U. It was just remarkable, but their, their view of their transformation was, was totally different. Um, the third one is, is, is pretty obvious. It's, has anybody been on a, a transformation where the status report was green and all the tasks were done, but nothing was different? Um, and that, that, that's a reality. I mean, there's budget to be managed. There's vendors to be managed. There's the reality of all that stuff. Um, and the change world likes to separate those. I, have, I see lots of, or I shouldn't see lots, but I still see people talking about uh, project management is over here. Change management is over here. The responsibilities of the project manager is X. The responsibilities of the change manager is Y. And then people will ask, is it time to merge the two? And for me, it's kind of a crazy question because they are intermixed. You know, if, it's, if, it, if there's too much on just managing the tasks, this is what we end up with, the watermelon report, right? Spent the budget, got all the tasks done, nothing's different. So how do we flip our approach from thinking about that and, and moving more towards experimentation? Uh, there's a company I'm doing some work with now. I can't mention them and I have to be a bit vague because I'm under NDA. Uh, briefly, they don't like the way they do change. 
but as a company, they're doing fantastic. So they want to quote unquote, use the lean change and agile change framework of mine to, to do change differently. And I've talked to them a few times about, you guys are doing great. Why would you want to do anything different? Is it just your perception that you don't think? Because they, they've said many times on, on our exploratory calls, uh, we're really bad at change. You know, we just, we do a bunch of PowerPoint decks, we throw a bunch of stuff over the wall, we do a bunch of information sessions, and it doesn't land and it doesn't stick. And we just keep doing that. And then, uh, so our experiment that we're starting tomorrow, or Thursday, is instead of rolling out this big change with four global divisions, we're going to try to do one thin slice through the entire organization for one teeny little part of this program, you know, by January to see if it works and prove it, which is completely opposite to what their approach is. So the experimentation comes into play about the willingness to do that despite the constraints that we have. It's a giant organization, they've got lots of governance, so there's lots of check boxes and documents and stuff to do. And we're pushing the boundaries on the need to do those things by changing how we do change. Uh, and we're being very open with the experimentation word that we don't know if this is going to work. Uh, let's find something that's not so high risk that we can try, because if it doesn't work, it's not going to be the end of the world. Um, this experiment for this picture, and it's probably pretty blurry because that was the iPhone three days. Um, this company, they wanted to do an agile transformation. Um, I won't use the words this, the, the CTO used because it was kind of rude. He, in a very rude way, uh, it was funny because the CEO and the CTO were twin brothers. Uh, so the, the CTO, they wanted to do an agile transformation because uh, the, 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 the CEO wanted to know where the F his $10 million in uh, research and development was going because I sure as F am not getting any product on the other side. So it was kind of a harsh thing to parachute into. So the first thing we did was we started visualizing the current state. And the biggest problem we found was with the 16 teams, their code uh, management was a nightmare. So frequent collisions, um, and they didn't really have anything in place that would help them sort that out. There was a build-in integration team, but they wouldn't know that things were broken there was no way for them to stop people from checking in code on something that was already broken. They hadn't had any of that infrastructure in place yet. So they had a big uh, hairball to sort out at release time. So what we did is we used a radio frequency uh, connector on their main build server. That's what that red siren is in the picture. And whenever uh, something would break the build, that siren would go off. And then they would go right to the logs and they would find out why, what caused it. And then they would go find the team and they used it as a training mechanism. They didn't use it as a punishment scheme. They wanted to find out why this was happening. So our experiment was, if we make this stuff visible, you know, this was an all open area. So all around this picture was just open tables where all the teams sat. So now other, they could, the teams could actually see when the siren would go off. So the experiment was, how are we gonna solve this problem? They still use this today. This was over 10 years ago. They use, obviously it's much more sophisticated nowadays, but they still use this as a way to keep their code base as clean as they can with you know, 700 developers. Uh, everything from uh, coding standards to uh, CSS rules and stuff like that, they still use this from that, that one experiment. And the whole idea is if we, the more uncertainty we have, the more we need to experiment because we can't predict the future. We can't plan our way through it. We have to take an action, see what happens, and we continue that process. Um, I, love, I love that notion of the more uncertainty, the more experiments. How did you on earth find leadership that would sign off on that? Uh, for Specifically for this scenario? Well, for the, the more uncertainty, the more experiments. 
Um, usually when we have a conversation about what experimentation means and we go a little bit deeper beyond the shininess of it, because Lean Startup kind of made experimentation fun and sexy. And then over the years, experimentation has become an excuse to not be thorough. So we, uh, depending on their, their, their level of association with that word, I've had some people that have said, experiment, things blow up when you experiment. Okay, then right. let's just call it purple elephants, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll still do experiments. We'll just call it something different. So um, once we have a conversation about what experimentation means, it doesn't mean just try anything we want and see what happens. It means there's the law of diminishing returns about how much thought and planning we can put into something that we can't possibly know the outcome to. So running the um, remember the future game from uh, innovation games. Yeah. Uh, or um, th there's another version of it. I can't remember where exactly it came from, but it's like the worst case scenario version of that. Uh, I dream low dream. Could be, yeah, something similar, but you, you, try to, you, you try to put some people thinking about what the future would be, the greatest scenario, the worst scenario, um, and then talk about where your threshold or your boundary is for uh, when you're ready to experiment. And once you kind of put it in those terms, uh, I find more people are open to trying things out because they realize it's not really the end of the world, depending on what the stakes are. Thanks. Um, the, the next one is, uh, co-creation over getting buy-in and getting buy-in is something that's been around in the change world forever too. We have to sell the change to people. Uh, so it kind of presumes that we understand entirely what the problem is. We know what the solution is, and now we got to get people to buy into those things. And as change people, it's impossible for us to know those first two. Um, we, we can't know exactly what the problems are in isolation, and we can't possibly pretend to know a solution as individuals. Uh, th theory U, yes, it is, it is uh, qu quite advanced. Um, if you step deeper than the diagram, um, the whole premise of theory U is around uh, collective responsibility of problem solving. You know, individuals can't possibly know the problem and find all the solutions. We have to do that in a co-creative way and collectively. Uh, and that happens through self-organization. So when we get into this, um, you know, after traveling, so many people would ask, how do I get the managers to buy in? You know, we're doing this agile transformation. The leaders aren't supporting it. How do I get them to buy in? And I always ask, what, uh, what the hell are you doing there then? If nobody wants to do this, then why are you there? Um, which is kind of a crazy question, but it, it it gives us a different lens to kind of really think about what it is they're asking for. Cause are they really asking for an agile transformation? Mm, maybe 10 years ago today, do you guys find that there's a lot of uh, fear of missing out factor to transformations where, because it's, it's in every article, it's all over social media companies feel they have to, because that's all they hear all the time is about innovation and companies transforming. It's hard to say. Uh, HBR talks about this. They have, um, I'll, I'll dig the, the link up uh, when I'm done, but they talk about uh, how transformations could look differently based in the industry. So if you look at um, highly volatile industries like uh, consumer electronics, things change very rapidly there. Uh, the way the market is, the barrier of entry is much lower for, for those products and services than it used to be. When you look at things like tire manufacturing, that's always gonna be around. So it's not like you're gonna see radical transformation and you're, you're not going to see thousands of competitors flood into making tires. It's gonna be the small handful of companies that you know, their transformations will look totally different from, you know, say a media company or newspapers or any industries that uh, there's more factors and more competitors. I think uh, Dave Snowden talks about this with uh, dominant predator theory, 
is these dominant predators, they can't see the threats coming from the sides. So when you look at the, uh, in software, I don't know if anyone's heard of the no code revolution or low code solutions like Bubble and Airtable and Stacker and all these modern tools. Um, you can build in a day what it'll take a team of 10 a month to build and it'll be better. Is generally speaking is the, is the idea. There are easily a few thousand low and no code platforms because when one comes out, it gets cloned a thousand times because it's easy to do. Like a 15 year old in their basement can create something. There's a, there's a low barrier. So transformations will all look differently depending on where you're at. And uh, the idea with uh, co-creation and buy-in is if you co-create the change, there's nothing to sell because you've, you've built what the right change is at the right time. And I think sometimes we get stuck into defining the change and trying to sell it and the timing is bad or it's not solving the right problem or we don't have enough information. Um, so if we can switch away from thinking about just selling this and move more towards uh, developing it together by exploring perspectives. The picture is a perspective map from a financial organization here. Same thing, they approached us and said, hey, we wanna do an agile transformation. Can you guys come in and blah, blah, blah. So the top left is the perspective of the organization. So we talked about why is this important to this company? Why now? Why not three years from now? Why not three years ago? So um, the <laughs> good question, what do low code product firms use to build their products? Probably React. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the top left was why it was important to the organization. We want to deliver things sooner. We want to manage risk. We want to reduce cost. On the top right was why it was important to the management team. Well, we want to build high performing teams, increase efficiency, improve quality. And from the team's perspective at the bottom, it was all of the, uh, you know, increase engagement, um, better morale, stuff like that. So when we co-create, we have to explore all three. So this kind of talks about the urgency thing a little bit. Uh, urgency is usually biased from the top left. So just the organization's view or the top right, because there's a leader who has something on their performance scorecard to make the transformation work. And that's why they're trying to make it urgent for other people. But we need to triangulate these three perspectives to, to co-create. And the last one's my favorite one, um, response to change over resistance. And uh, is anybody familiar with version one's state of agile survey? It's uh, what is it? The 15th year for it, 15th or 16th? Resistance to change has been number one at about 50 to 55% for 15 straight years. So it's kind of like, are we getting any smarter? Are we solving the problem or do we not really know what the problem is? So if we flipped our perspective away from blaming people for being resistant and using that response as insights into how we can change the change, we'll be in a better spot. So, you know, we get into, if we think we have to overcome resistance, it puts us in a push mode. It creates more stress, creates more anxiety, but it puts us in the mindset of this is going to be a fight. And we need to use force to overcome this, as opposed to switching our stance to being a facilitator and using that reaction to gain insights. So things like uh, the change world talks about act active resistance and passive resistance. Active being, screw you, I'm not doing this. And passive being, yeah, totally, this is the greatest thing ever. I think we should all totally do this and nothing happens. So they try to break those things into two buckets. Um, it's almost better if people actively resist. If people are very upset and vocal about the change, that's perfect because that's good data to tell you that something's not right. Maybe the timing isn't right. Maybe it's not the right change. Maybe the way we're going about the change is, is not the right thing to do. Um, if we have apathy, we have no information. Uh, the question here, this was from a, a retrospective with a management team where, um, you get to a point in a transformation where it feels like it's stalled. Somebody get that feeling sometimes you're humming along and then it just feels like it's stuck and it's stalled and nothing's happening and you don't know why. 
we were kind of at that point. It seemed like people were just really tired and they were just sick of this. And so my colleague wrote this question on the whiteboard, what are you tolerating? And we probably had the best retrospective we ever had. So some of the things, you know, there's pace of transformation, it's too fast. Certain communication styles we don't like. Uh, there's no transparency for this. Um, uh, one down below, you can't see it. It's uh, uh, no more lunchtime meetings. So we were kind of hoping they said that they were tolerating us. So it was our chance to reaffirm that we're here to help and support. If, if we're being irritating and if we're in the way, let us know, we'll back off. Um, because we felt that was the right thing to do, not, not for any other reason. But we were really in tune to how people were responding to stuff and we were using that as information to decide what our experiment should be next. So putting those, uh, those things together, it's, it's like a different set of lenses. It's, um, it's very hard to think outside the box, right? Um, that's why there is a box. We, we can't, humans, I, I've been in situations when I was doing deep embedded coaching where after you know five, six, seven months, you're kind of too far in the soup. And you can't think outside the box because you're sucked into the reality, the day-to-day -day reality of the organization. You need an outside perspective. So the ideas with these five universals, um, this is going to be coming early in the new year. Right now, there's a, a card game, an online card game that will poke you with ideas that um, maybe this is what's going on. And now what can I do about it? So it's going to be like a, a, a GPS that you can look at a change through a different lens, create experiments, uh, read stories from people who've been stuck in the same spot and what they did about it, um, and different ideas and tools and practices you can try when you feel stuck. And that was the whole mission of that six year uh, world tour was to basically make Tinder for change agents because I'll guarantee whatever problem you're stuck in, somebody in the world's been stuck in the same spot and they've figured it out. So why not try to create a way for those folks to connect to each other uh, to figure this out? So that was the idea with the universals. Um, and those universals, it, it's one of many elements that'll help you figure out how to get unstuck. So um, just to close things off, the, the idea of those, those four dimensions, it's to create balance. We move change forward when we balance who we are as humans, the stance we take towards change. That affects the tools and the practices we use and the ideas that we hold on to. So this ecosystem is designed to kind of give us a, um, a troubleshooting guide and a way to get to action sooner so we can take one small step forward. And that concludes this. So I thought we could either, uh, since I, we were gonna do a lean coffee if we had um, a greater number of people, but I think we can just do an open, an open chat. Questions, comments, thoughts? I am so happy to hear this put into an organized presentation uh, because this is the form of change management I've been trying to practice. And I keep getting looked at very strangely by other uh, traditional change practitioners because they want me to check the boxes, right? Oh, you must have this kind of that and this kind of thing at this point. And, and we've got to have all these hoops to jump through. And it's like, yeah, maybe not so much. Let's just get the people who are going to have to change their lives involved in designing their future, maybe we can cut out a lot of the busy work. Mm -hmm. And so this is awesome, Jason. Thank you. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. You're, you're the second group to hear this. 
this is all the, the next evolution of stuff. The first was a conference uh, on Sunday. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll put the link to our Slack in the chat because uh, there's a bunch oh, awesome. of trainers and like early adopter people that are previewing a, a bunch of the new ideas and stuff. And if you're interested in checking it out. You betcha. Thank you. this the chat yeah it's a work it's a work in progress now um the the card game for the universals is uh um i'll find that link too it's at um So this is just based on the universals. It was, if I can find them, the, the uh, physical card game back when we were allowed to go outside. So the ideas have been kicking around and percolating for a couple of years, and it's just the last number of months, it's become a little more clear what it, uh, what it could look like. Um, so it was a card game we would actually play in the workshops. So let's take a real cha uh, change challenge that you have. Here's the 52 perspectives, deal the cards out, which ones do you think it might be? And now let's explore it together and co-create. Um, and then that URL is where the, uh, the online version of it is. Thank you so much, Jason, for um, for sharing your insights. You're welcome. So, Jason, this is Jay. So, well, I was curious, you know, as you, you know, based on your experience, you've been doing this. One of the, a lot of studies now have recently focused on this notion of agile scrum as and the and the leadership models for the extroverts. And then the introverts of the teams, which I would argue is most software engineers, uh, don't actively or want to actively necessarily participate. And especially Alistair Cockburn, you know, this whole face-to-face -face communication, you know, we're finding out that that was not necessarily as important now that the pandemic showed, right? So as you went through this change management, did you have to, you know, orient it differently for the introverts inside the organization versus the extroverts, or did you see a difference? For, for me, it was, um, I went to an intrapreneur conference and one of the speakers who I can't remember her name, uh, she said, um, she was talking about diversity and inclusion. And right. diversity is uh, getting diversity of thought invite people to the party and the inclusiveness is ask them to dance and then I added let and let them opt out so my approach is invite everybody to the party give them an opportunity to dance but let them check out if they don't want to participate so introvert extrovert made no difference to me whatsoever uh, as the facilitator I would just manage those things differently because you need to obviously you need to do more uh you need to do something to help introverts speak up sometimes um depending on what it was but for me it was always open it up to everybody and let the ones that wanted to participate stick around cool i think one of the things i'm experimenting with is to have you know more channels for the introverts because introverts like to text write things and, and document things and they feel more comfortable doing that uh, by themselves in, in a group, right? So one of the experimentation I was thinking of doing for the for change, you know, leadership in these sessions is for the introverts to, to have them a channel, whether it's Yammer or Slack or whatever, or email, and, and have a way to which they can communicate and participate. So it's the same thing when we do retros and we talk about stuff, I'm doing the same experiment there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, some people just don't feel comfortable, right? Even though the Aristotle Project, you know, found, you know, having a, 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 a psychological safe environment is a little bit more complex than just letting everyone speak up and not speak over each other and all those things that they talked about. It's also 
allowing for these different personalities and, and different, especially for the neurodiverse individuals in the workforce, right? So mm-hmm. I'm kind of experimenting with that now. I know it's more work to gather that information and data and then make sense out of it and report it out. But uh, I'm just, you know, that's an experiment. I'm, I think I'm going to run. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any questions from anyone uh, from uh, here? Interface, I'd like to build on what you were just saying. Um, one of the techniques that I've started to do with retros, since we're all remote, right? Not in the room, we're using a board. And so getting people to put the stuff on the virtual stickies mm-hmm. first and offline, and then use that valuable everybody in the room time to talk about what's on the stickies. I think that's one of those things that helps the introverts. It really does. Yeah, we've been doing that, the mirror board. We've been doing that a lot with that and and then gathering that data. But now on the change measure, when you facilitate change and have an open conversation like Jason does and everything, it does lend, in my opinion, Jason, it lends itself to people that are comfortable speaking up in front of teams and in front of groups and providing their uh, their advice or or like we were doing that whole thing where they said well you know here are the things we we want to change and and so forth um, so to, in that context you know that's where uh, it's difficult because one of the, and I don't know Jason if that's part of your patterns you look at so the communication strategy and the communications of how we're going to communicate out to the organization and inward to the teams change you know happens you have to communicate about mm-hmm. it right and it's 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 all levels that's top down mm-hmm. bottom up communication right and you have to have some way of doing that or mm-hmm. some structured i hate to use that word mm-hmm. structured way of communicating right out and and in outward and inward um so that's part of that right so, so those layers uh, like you said jason you know you know, change management would be real, real easy if people weren't involved. Yeah. <laughs> well, once you get people involved, then it's all, you know, it's a whole different ball game, right? Yep. And it's very complex. So I think the new studies in in, in neuroscience and 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 psychology in this field, I'm seeing a lot of studies in this and, and a lot of publications I'm reading that I think could help us in this in this change. I call it change leadership. I don't like to use words change management too much anymore or organizational change management. I know that people still use it. Mm-hmm. This rubs me the wrong way. But uh, but I, I'm seeing a lot of research coming out that that may be able that we may be able to use Jason to help help in this in this uh, arena. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the things that that accelerated it, yeah, I think obviously is is COVID. You, I don't know if you've seen a lot of the great resignation content getting posted. Yes. All over the, com, companies now, I think, are um, um, not companies. I think pe- people are recognizing that they don't have to stay in an environment they don't like being in. They, they realize that they can work from anywhere with anyone at any time. Whereas pre-COVID, it was like, well, I'm stuck. You know, I've got a family to support. I have to stay here. And now I think we've proven that you can work anywhere you want. You really can. I know lots of lot, those, some of those golden retrievers I talked about from those companies, two of them or three of them over the last two years uh, left their enterprise gigs because they got a breather and they thought, you know what? I could probably use my talents to dent the world and not just sit here helping this billion dollar corporation. There's not absolutely nothing wrong with that, but they found that they love doing this work so much, they wanted to go a level deeper into doing something that gave back to society. And I think a lot of people are realizing that they, they have choice. And I think that's putting companies in a position to maybe move more towards co-creation or more freedom of choice uh, for people. And certainly not all, like the banks in Canada are a great example. Uh, they account for you know 40% of the Canadian economy. They're what's called an ogalopoly. So the big six control the market. So they don't really out-innovate each other. They just have to make sure all six of them innovate the same way to keep 
people at the bay. Plus they're a protected species anyway from, from the government. So they kind of all do the same things. And there's certain pockets that have really strong, compelling, uh, purpose-driven things, but overall a bank is a bank. And those folks are waking up to realize that they could go do something else. They, they don't have to if they don't want to. Right. Um, and I yeah. think, you know, it's, it's, ref it's kind of refreshing the Lulu model of organizations now. And, you know, back in the day when that came out, most of us were reading it on, yeah, this is so complex. And to stratify and structure companies and organizations and get to the teal, it's like, who's ever going to do that? I, I put a lot of credit with the millennials. So that generation, when they came in the workforce, they said, well, if this company isn't doing something for society, and if they're not doing this or that, I ain't working for them. I don't care how much they pay me, which is very different than my generation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Par parents have a role in that, too. Yes. I, I, I know lots of uh, parents my age that have kids my age or even kids a little bit older that they're 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 pushing them down the same university path they went to certainly nothing wrong with it but i think they forget that there's more choice nowadays you know with ed yeah what is it edx.org um harvard berkeley these reputable schools are giving education away for free obviously it's a lead model right where you can you can buy other things but there's more choice than there was for us right it was thou shalt go to college or university, get a degree, get married, have two kids, buy a station wagon and retire at 55. That's just the way it worked. And now it's totally not like that. Right. And, and that's nowadays you do take a bank loan and you're not able to pay it back if you get the pension. So maybe you start to think about the purpose in life more than yeah. before. Yep. Right. And, and I think that applies to your model, Jason, because when if I look at your model and the experimentation you're doing, what you're really saying is you're giving the, you're, you're really saying the leaders of the organization and the team, you're accountable for making choices. Here's a framework that we can use. Here's some of the tools, here's, you know, and I can facilitate, but at the end of the day, you've got to make the choice yep. of what to do and how to apply it. That's kind of what I'm hearing, Jason. Yes, it's it's very heavily based on Virginia Satir's work uh, and okay. congr con congruence. So self other context is if you are if you're wanting to do a process improvement program, call it a process improvement program. Don't BS people with transformation and mindset language because there's absolutely nothing wrong with process improvement. We've just kind mm -hmm. of been taught as agile people that that's evil and bad. Hey. Sometimes that's the best a telecom can do. And that's awesome. So be congruent. Yep. Uh, so yeah, all of this is, is heavily based on, uh, on Satir's work. Cool. Yeah. All right. Any other questions from anyone? So what I would like if anyone, there's only a few of us here. Uh, so uh, Jason uh, nicely, very nicely has uh, uh, said he's going to provide us a signed book. And he's got some digitals he'll put in the link here that you can go to. So I was going to say, if anyone wants that, put, you know, say yes in the chat. The first one I see that says yes gets the book. Oh, everybody will get one. There's not that many. Oh. <laughs> so. I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> but I, didn't want, I didn't want to pressure you. Yeah. <laughs> so if... Um, how do you want to do that, Jason? Do you want them to send you their email and address or me? Uh, it doesn't matter. Either or. Just I'll just need a um, uh, physical address. Send it, send it to my email. And then, yeah, I'll send them off. Cool. And, and does everyone have Jason's email? You wanna, might want to put it in the chat. I got your email, but I don't know if they do. Yep. <laughs> I know where you live, Jason. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, so thank you, Jason. And and the book's really good. I, I recommend it. I've, I've read both of your books and uh, very good. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I was expecting a low turnout because it is, you know, holiday season in December. Now, this is kind of weird. Meetup has crashed. I don't know if you all try to get on the meetup lately. I, nobody can get into it. 
and I, I don't know if that played a role, but uh, uh, I'm going to rec I've recorded this. We have a YouTube channel. I put it out in the chat. Uh, in a couple of days, I'll upload this to our YouTube channel so others can can uh, learn and, and see it. And we've got like, I don't know, 30 or 40 videos out there from lots of different people. So go out there and explore. Cool. All right. Well, Jason, thank you very much. I'll let you go back to work or whatever. <laughs> uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining. And again, uh, I'll send an email out via Meetup when the video is uploaded. So thank you, everyone. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.